Hi, everybody. Welcome to the uh, August 2022 SJAA Imaging Special Interest Group meeting. And tonight we're going to um, continue our series on narrowband imaging. Last month, uh, Alex talked to us about uh, narrowband imaging and, and described his app for doing that. Tonight, Francesco is going to talk, Francesco Mescia is going to talk to us about. Uh, the why and how of narrowband imaging and follow it up in a couple months with um, some examples of processing narrowband imaging. Next month, Julian uh, Lecomte will talk to us a little bit about uh, maker projects for astro imaging. Um, and I want to uh, once again encourage anybody who uh, has some uh, other presentations to make. We would love to hear you speak at one of these meetings. Please uh, send an email to our imaging mailing list or to me directly and uh, love to hear from you and get you to talk. So without further ado, Francesco, take it away. Thank you very much. Hi, let me share my presentation. All right. And no. Great. So thank you very much and uh, good evening uh, to everybody. I, my name is Francesco Meschia. Uh, this is the first uh, of a series of two presentations I'll be giving about uh, narrowband imaging. And uh, I called this first uh, presentation why and how, because uh, we're going to discuss exactly that. Why we do narrowband imaging, why is it, uh, has it changed the way that the uh, amateurs do astro imaging and how we capture narrowband data. Tonight, we're not gonna talk about processing, the how is the how to acquire narrowband data. So uh, I will start with the definition. So what is narrowband imaging? Uh, we call it narrowband imaging the set of, a set of techniques, it's not just one. And uh, these are all the techniques that involve the capturing and the processing of images of astronomical objects by using only very small and narrow portions of the visible spectrum of light. And we do that by selecting uh, the portions of the spectrum of, of our interest using uh, narrow band, band filters with narrow bandpass windows. So that's why we call it narrow band imaging. It refers to the bandpass of the filters. But how narrow is narrow? <clears throat> so if um, I, I put on this slide, uh, a chart, I believe I took it from uh, Astronomic, and it's uh, a representation of uh, the, the visible spectrum and then some. So everything between 400 and 800 nanometers. What we can see with our eyes is essentially the region between the 400 and uh, 700 nanometers. Of course, there are, there are <laughs> individual differences that people can see a little more. And people, some people can see a little less. But let's say that as an average, we have a, about a 300 nanometer window in terms of the wavelengths of the photons that we can see. When we do what's called broadband imaging, using, a, for instance, RGB filters or using a one-shot color camera, each of the filters, essentially the three filters, uh, divide the spectrum among them so that each filter is roughly 100 nanometer in um, has a 100 nanometer wide window of transmission. When we talk about the narrowband filters, what's commercially available today has uh, transmission windows that go from uh, three nanometers to 15 nanometers. So they are several times uh, narrower than, uh, uh, than a typical RG or B filter. It can be 30 times narrower or can be just a five or six time, uh, times narrower. And, uh, there are differences, of course, in uh, what you can obtain with the different uh, bandwidth of the filter. And uh, as a graphical representation, I tried to put here the superimposed to the three windows for R, G, and B. I put uh, the, um, the three transmission windows for three, uh, three nanometer uh, narrowband filters, the oxygen three, uh, hydrogen alpha, and uh, sulfur two. Now, our hydro oxygen-3 has a, is the, the shortest wavelength at 500.7 nanometers. H-alpha has a, it's an intermediate uh, 
<clears throat> wave, central wavelet in, uh, in the red region at 656.3 nanometers. And finally, sulfur 2 has a 672 nanometer as a central wavelength. Okay, this is great, but why do we care about this? Why is it important? Why do we, why do we like, even though it's not important for us amateurs to do narrowband imaging? Well, <clears throat> I will start off by quoting uh, our host, Hi, who once uh, uh, said in this forum, why, do, why are stars bright? Well, stars give off light because they're hot. <clears throat> the, and uh, they, they behave essentially like a piece of metal brought to very high temperature. In more scientific terms, they behave like black body radiators. And they, their, uh, their emission, the spectral, the spectral composition of the light they emit has a, a continuous spectrum. And it depends, uh, depending on the, the temperature of the star, this uh, spectral composition may have a peak at a one wavelength rather than another. For instance, a red star may have a central, uh, may have a, a, a peak wavelength of about 700 nanometers, so it would look uh, red. A yellow star may have a, a central, uh, sorry, a peak uh, wavelength of about 550 nanometers like our sun. And a blue star <clears throat> could be deep uh, in, in the blue region or if it's really, really hot, even in the ultraviolet. So this is the way stars behave. There's a, they emit lights at essentially all wavelengths following the, the laws that uh, describe a black body, black body radiator. However, not everything in the universe behaves like that. When astronomers started studying the spectra of nebulae in the 19th century, and back then anything that was not a star was called a nebula, they didn't have uh, uh, the perception of what is the difference between what we now call a, a, a galactic nebula and what, we, what is a different galaxy, like Andromeda used to be called uh, the Andromeda Nebula until 1920. So they, they found uh, that some nebula had a spectrum that uh, resembled a star spectrum, with, so with a continuous uh, distribution of photons in the various wavelengths, but other nebulas were radically different. And this is, a, of course, a modern spectrum that I, uh, that I picture here. But you see, th that is a, a line type of spectrum in which there is a continuum. And it's basically almost a background continuum. But uh, there are very prominent uh, spectral lines. Now, we call them lines just because uh, if you look at them, uh, if you look at the spectrum of a star through a spectroscope, uh, you're going to see a line that represents uh, the, uh, the slit of the spectroscope illuminated by one monochromatic uh, light, one monochromatic wave. But they, yeah, they look like, uh, if you plot them in a chart like this, they look like uh, sharp vertical peaks. And uh, back then, although they didn't understand why, they knew that different chemical elements had different sets of the of spectral lines. And they had atlases of, uh, of spectra for uh, different elements. And as an example, I, here I have uh, the, the spectrum of um, the emission from hydrogen. So if you have a hydrogen lamp, you're going to have one uh, uh, red line at 656 nanometer, which we call H alpha, and then another one, uh, a blue one at 486 nanometer, H beta, and then H gamma and H delta at, uh, at shorter wavelength. But uh, despite the fact that they had these atlases, and they had some mathematical rules that allowed them to predict what kind of a, what wavelength they would expect from an element, there were some combinations of lines that uh, couldn't be replicated by any known element on Earth. And so people started, out, started wondering, are they due to new elements that we haven't discovered yet? And uh, I'm bringing here the two cases that are the most famous ones. So in uh, 1864, Huggins uh, observed uh, the, the, ne the planetary nebula NGC 6543, which uh, is also known as the Cat's Eye Nebula, uh, for the first time. No, nobody had seen a planetary nebula with a spectroscope before that. 
And what he found that there was a combination of three spectral lines at 372 nanometers, 495 nanometers, and 501 nanometers. And this combination could not be traced back to any known element found on Earth. And so he thought that he had discovered a new element, which was called, was it actually given a name, it was called the nebulium. And uh, four years, uh, sorry, uh, five years later in uh, 1869, there was a solar eclipse on August the 7th. And uh, two different teams of astronomers observed, uh, took a spectrum of the corona. And they found that there was a green line at 530.3 nanometers that again could not be associated with any element known on Earth. And so they, they christened another chemical element that was uh, previously undiscovered and they called it coronium. However, as our understanding of uh, the how spectra are created, our understanding of uh, the mechanics of, of the atom became better and better, we found that this uh, better theories unmask the familiar faces. So nebulium didn't actually exist. Actually, people found that uh, they, if they predicted the, the, the number of electrons that this element should have, they found that there was no room for a new element uh, in, the, in the periodic table of elements. And what they found is actually you don't need it. You don't even need it to assume that there is a new element because uh, that spectrum is uh, perfectly explained by uh, the emission of an oxygen from which you take away two electrons. So you, twice, you ionize the oxygen twice in very low pressure conditions, so hard to replicate on Earth, and you get that kind of spectrum. Same thing with coronium. Coronium was actually found to be nothing else but uh, uh, the spectral line that you get uh, by ionizing an atom of iron by 13 times. So taking away 13 electrons from, uh, from, uh, from the 56 uh, that the, iron, the, the atom of iron has. So, uh, okay, this is great, but are we still talking about test or imaging in this uh, presentation? Well, yes, because uh, most of the stuff in the universe, uh, as we know, is hydrogen. Hydrogen has been present in the universe since the Big Bang. Is the simplest uh, of all uh, atoms made up made up of one proton and one electron. It cannot be produced by any other uh, by, by fusing any other reaction. Is the simplest one. When an hydrogen atom is ionized by radiation, like shine a UV light on a, on a cloud of uh, hydrogen, uh, if the radiation is a sufficiently strong and energetic, it will ionize. This, uh, this gas of hydrogen atoms. And the ionizing means that we will strip away some of the electrons from the, 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 sh the electron shell of the, of the atoms. Eventually, these electrons will recombine with the free proton to form another hydrogen atom. But when doing so, and the electron may find itself initially at a higher energy state than the one that it was previously because it has received some of the energy from the incoming radiation. And will eventually fall towards what we call the ground state, the, the lowest energy state, by transitioning in, uh, into intermediate states. When it transitions from the state associated with the principal quantum number three to the principal quantum number two, it emits a radiation at a very precise wavelength of 656.28 nanometers. And that's what we call hydrogen alpha. And it's one of those uh, of the uh, lines from uh, what's called the Volmer series, that they are all uh, transitions from a higher energy state into the state uh, with the principal quantum number two. The beauty of this is that most of the universe glows in H alpha when excited by the ionizing radiation. So when you have a a very hot star, lots of uh, ultraviolet uh, radiation, and around it, there's a cloud of gas, chances are it will blow in H alpha. So it makes a lot of sense to image at this wavelength because we know that we're going to see stuff. But what other interesting stuff is there? Well, it's uh, star stuff, as Carl Sagan would put it. So they are, save for some helium that was created in the Big Bang, 
all of the other elements on the periodic table are made in stars. So if you want, if you are a, a research astronomer, if you want to study stellar evolution, for instance, looking at planetary nebulae that are one of the stages of stellar evolution, uh, it is probably a good idea to be looking uh, at uh, oxygen three, because as we know, since uh, the beginning of our history of observing uh, planetary nebulae, we found that O3 was present in those shells. And uh, if we look at the table that I put on the right, these are the relative abundances of uh, uh, chemical elements in the Milky Way, which we consider to be a proxy for the rest of the universe. So hydrogen, of course, takes the cake, and uh, helium is a, is, a, is a good second. But then, although it's distant third, the, the third most abundant element is oxygen. So you definitely want to look at that. Then you have uh, carbon, neon, iron, uh, nitrogen, silicon, magnesium, and sulfur. Sulfur with the uh, atomic number of 16 is, uh, is not a very widely abundant uh, element uh, in, uh, in the universe, but it's interesting because it's associated with uh, the later stages of evolution of very massive stars. So red supergiants, when they start uh, uh, forming uh, heavier elements. And uh, there are markers of a stellar evolution. These are some of the reactions that you find uh, in, in the so-called multi-alpha multi process. So uh, a star like the sun fuses uh, uh, hydrogen into helium. But when you have produced helium, if the temperature is sufficiently high, helium nuclei can fuse and produce beryllium. And uh, if, you, if you fuse another uh, helium nucleus with a, with a beryllium nucleus, you are going to produce carbon. And then carbon plus helium, you get oxygen, oxygen plus helium, neon, neon plus helium, magnesium, and then silicon, and then sulfur. And you can continue getting, uh, producing the argon, calcium, uh, titanium, chromium, iron, and finally uh, nickel. And uh, iron and nickel are the last two elements that can be produced uh, in a steady state star because uh, our uh, past uh, nickel, you need to, burn, to spend more energy to fuse two nuclei than you get in return. So it cannot possibly sustain a star at that point. And all of the elements heavier than nickel are produced uh, in uh, supernova explosions. So, why sulfur? Why is it interesting? <clears throat> and to whom? Well, ionized sulfur is present, as we said, in planetary nebula, especially when those that are shed by very massive stars. And they need to be big because they need to be hot enough at some point in their life cycle to produce uh, sulfur. So to, and in order to produce sulfur, they must have produced all of the other elements up to, sil up to silicon to be able to do that. And of course, it's also present in supernova remnants because the supernova produces essentially everything. It's um, uh, professional astronomers found that uh, the abundance of uh, sulfur appears to be correlated with regions of compression, like uh, shock fronts in the interstellar medium. And of course, if you are a research astronomer and you want to study the interstellar medium and uh, its interaction with uh, supernova explosion, planetary nebula, etc. This is interesting. But why do we care as amateur for, uh, uh, for sulfur too? I don't really have a, a precise answer. Maybe it's because we want to like the, the Hubble images in the uh, SHO palette, and we like to do the same. There's also it's also true that some of, the, of us amateur astronomers don't care about uh, S2, and they are perfectly happy with doing uh, what's called bicolor imaging using just the hydrogen and oxygen. So you might have heard about HOO imaging. That's what it is. There's another reason, in my opinion, and it's uh, that if you want to produce a, a full color image, you need to be able to uh, stimulate all the three types of receptors in our in the human eye. And uh, those three types of receptors are, uh, well, first of all, there are three, and they are they respond to red, green, and blue. And so it is convenient to have uh, three different, uh, to capture data in three different wavelengths that have different uh, 
uh, morphologies, different shapes, so that you can combine them into an interesting uh, full color image. And we're gonna dig deeper into this in the second uh, session in, uh, in two months. So <clears throat> are there other interesting lines? Sure, there's a lot, a uh, lot of them. For instance, uh, one, uh, another one that I'd like to see more is uh, H-beta. I remember when I was uh, buying uh, a sky, telescopes, sky, sky telescope in the late 80s or maybe early 90s, there was uh, every, every issue had a full page advertising by Lumicon. And uh, Lumicon made uh, and, uh, and sold uh, H-beta filters and their claim was, uh, I can see the horse at Nebula with the, the H-beta filter. Because the idea was that you would be able to see B33 as a dark notch against the backdrop of the IC434, which is a hydrogen cloud. So it will glow mostly in H-alpha, but our eyes, of course, are not sensitive to that wave and at night. But they can see, the, they can see well in the region where H-beta is. So if you put a filter that increases the contrast of that line, you would be able to see it visually. For, uh, from an imaging perspective, it's probably not that, uh, that interesting. Where there's H-alpha, there's, sorry, where there's H-beta, there's also H-alpha. So it's, uh, it's probably gonna have the same type of structures, the same morphology that you already have captured in H-alpha. And also we have to deal with what's available on the market. Most commercial filter, narrowband filter sets are still H alpha, S2, and O3. And so we get what, what we can find. Okay, so we know why we, we would like to image uh, those wavelengths, but why does it need to be done with a narrow band filter? Can't I just use uh, my RGB filters or my OSC camera? After all, if you capture everything uh, with, a, with a 100 nanometer wide filter, you're also gonna capture those wavelengths. Why is it important to capture only those wavelengths? And there's a number of reasons for this. For instance, selectivity, the fact that you are gonna cut and only, only see the objects that have that line emission or almost only. And this gives you also better contrast. The, the use of narrowband filters give you less uh, star presence. The stars are less, uh, uh, are smaller, are tighter, they are less intrusive on your image. And then there's the reason, which in my opinion is the most important, is that uh, if with a narrowband filter, you are greatly reducing uh, the adverse effect of light pollution. And the narrower is the bandwidth, the greater is the benefit. So I have here a few examples that I'd like to share with you. And uh, I'm gonna start talking about uh, the effect of a contrast the effect of narrowband on contrast, detail, and star presence. So we, if you isolate only one wavelength, you're only going to see those structures that uh, emit in that uh, particular wavelength, or almost those. As we know, there's always a, com a continuum component, but thanks to Alex, we have the mathematical tools to remove them and go back to observing almost or almost um, exclusively or almost exclusively that way. But the result is that uh, the details, and in particular the edges, become very crisp, sharp. An additional benefit that is that since the stars are black body radiators, if you select their light with an narrowband filter, you're going to throw away most of the light that, of that star. And so the stars, the, the throughput of the stars, the photons collected uh, by your sensor from, that come from the stars, will be way fewer than uh, otherwise with a, with a broadband filter. So you're gonna get results similar to this. So this is uh, the same object, NGC 281, the Pac-Man Nebula, image with the same telescope, but with a noisy camera on the left and a narrowband camera on the right. And the, the, the narrowband camera using a, a, a four nanometer O3 filter sorry, for the 4 nanometer or 3S2 and um, uh, H alpha filter gives uh, those nice uh, filaments in the, in the dark clouds that you wouldn't, you simply don't see in the, um, in the OSC camera. And uh, also the stars, in the left image, the stars take, 
take the limelight. You don't. You mostly see the stars, and the, in the the image on the right, the stars are not intrusive at all. It's uh, they don't take away anything from the nebula. They make it actually very legible. Another example is here. This is the famous. Uh, I can't remember the catalog number, but it's the Tadpoles Nebula. Again, on the left uh, with an OSC, and uh, on the right uh, with a bi in a bicolor palette. palette. It's uh, HOO, so hydrogen and oxygen. Look at how the, the two tadpoles, you have to almost make an effort to, to see where they are in the OSC camera. And they are very contrasty, on the other hand, uh, in the narrow band image. They contrast in color and they contrast in shape. They are, the shapes are very sharp. You can see the, uh, the body of the tadpole, so to speak, and not just the head. Also, look at the dark clouds. Uh, you see the, the, some details in, the, in the, those wisps around, dark wisps around the, the dark clouds that are simply not visible in OSC. And again, the stars, this is, there's a big uh, uh, open cluster at the core of this nebula. It's actually the cluster that makes the, the nebula glow. And the, it's uh, much uh, more manageable, I would say, in the narrow band rendition. So there is a benefit there in, uh, in making uh, images that are more striking, in which the contrast uh, of shapes and the contrast of color is much more attractive. Again, I'm talking about aesthetics, not about science here. <laughs> it's pretty pictures. <clears throat> OK, what I believe is the real game changer, though, is uh, the reduced impact of light pollution. And this is especially important for urban imagers and suburban imagers. Okay. Why is it, uh, why is that? Well, nowadays, we all have uh, LED lighting in our, on our streets. Light pollution is essentially broadband. And if you use a narrowband, you cut down the light pollution very efficiently. And uh, I know that uh, some people uh, would object uh, if, I, if I say this on, uh, <clears throat> on cloudy nights, that, oh, you can achieve the same with good uh, gradient management, with uh, gradient reduction, gradient subtraction, you, you call it, you name it. Well, let's see if that is true. <clears throat> there is a common misconception that I'd like to fight here, is that uh, we cannot image uh, objects that are fainter than the background because uh, light pollution hides your faint object. Well, if you think about it, that mm, doesn't really work that way. Light always adds. So even a faint object would always ride on top of the background light, not under the background. If you have a, a a background sky that gives you one sec, one photon per second per pixel, and uh, you only get uh, uh, half a second <coughs> per photon, sorry, half a photon per second per pixel from an astronomical object, you're still going to have one and a half photons per second per pixel <coughs> when, uh, if you're imaging the object. So there's always additional light. And it's not just a matter of contrast or uh, saturation either. Otherwise, we would solve all of these problems by doing gradient subtraction and using short exposure to avoid saturation. And we would have, uh, we would have defeated light pollution. Doesn't work that way. I think we all know that it's, uh, that's not the, the right proposition. And I'd like to, to explain why. In my opinion, why is because uh, the name of this game is a signal to noise ratio, SNR here. So photons are not coming, uh, light is not a liquid. Uh, photons are not coming uh, as a continuous flow, but they arrive one by one. They are quanta. And uh, <clears throat> the result of this is that their, their arrival is described by, uh, the, by a theory, a, statistic, a statistical property that has statistical properties of a Poisson distribution. It was studied by Poisson. Rare, rare events behave in a certain way. And so if you, if you have two detectors, like two pixels in a sensor that are counting photons exactly from the same source, at the end of an exposure, we likely end up with two different tallies, even in a perfect camera. It has nothing to do with the camera, has uh, everything to do with the, with the nature of light. 
there will always be a certain probability of getting any non-zero count. And I have a here hand-drawn uh, what could be the distribution of the photon counts uh, in, a, in a typical uh, coming from the background, for instance. You're going to have a mean count for all, all of your pixels that are exposed to the same, uh, same light. And uh, this distribution are, is also going to have a certain standard deviation, certain width. Well, a property of uh, Poisson events is that the standard deviation is equal to the square root of the mean. So if the mean represents the number of counts of, uh, of photons by your detector, you can expect the standard deviation in the, this distribution equal to the square root of the average number of photons. And this is a very important property because it creates a, we can work this to our advantage. Because it's not the number of photons from light pollution that hides a faint object. It is the fact that from pixel to pixels, there are variations. There's the standard deviation, uh, 60, 66 times out of 100, you can expect uh, that the variation from one pixel to the next will be less than one standard deviation. And it's this variation that makes a weak signal undetectable because it's uh, the variation itself is larger than the signal that you want. This is what we call photon noise. Some people also call it shock noise because of a different, uh, by focusing on a different property of what they do. It's nothing to do with the camera again. It's the nature of the photon beast. If you want to see an object, you're, you need to have a, a signal that's larger than the noise. And uh, I'm going to give you some examples here. This is a, a simulated examples. Uh, let's assume that I'm imaging uh, a target like the one that I have in the upper left, in the upper right. There's a certain background, and there's a, a region of uh, my, my object space that is brighter than the rest. And I'm going to change uh, the, uh, the brightness of this. If we start with a situation in which uh, I get one photons, photon per second per pixel from the background, and uh, the brighter square at the center only adds uh, 0.05 photons per second per pixel, so I can expect uh, as an average one photon every 20 seconds. At the end of a 600, a 600 second exposure, I'm going to have that the mean value, the mean number of photons counted is going to be 600 per pixel. The standard deviation associated with that will be 24 photons. So from one pixel to the next, I can expect 66% uh, of the time. Um, a difference less of less than 24 photons. And the signal is only 30 photons per pixel. So the signal to noise ratio is uh, almost one. In this, uh, in the chart uh, on the, the lower left, I have, uh, I have plotted the number, the count of photons in each pixel along the, the dashed line. And I don't see the object. I don't see any difference that makes me think, oh yeah, this is the part, this is the brighter part of this object. It's virtually, and to my eye at least, it's virtually undetectable. Hey Francesco, on your screen though, uh, yep. you may be showing the right part of the slide because there's a, at least for me, a pretty clear rectangle there. You mean, uh, uh, I don't have a cursor here, but uh, you mean on the, on the left, uh, on the upper right, yeah. Oh, right, yes. So the upper right just represents uh, what, let's say, the image space. No, sorry, the object space. So I have a, uh, I have. A, there is a difference there. If I look at the the number of counts, this is a, I am essentially I amplify the difference. Oh, in the I got image, it. Sorry, but I the count uh, corresponds to the actual numbers. Uh, so yeah, this is this one is undetectable if I look at the numbers. Now let's do the same. Uh, with the, with the larger number of photons. So I have a, the, a background, the same background, one photons per second per pixel, and the, the, I increase the signal 10 times. It's a zero point, let's say 0 0.1 photons per second per pixel. With this, <clears throat> actually, sorry, this is a mistake. It was, uh, used to be 0 0.08. And the exposure is still 600 times. So the mean is the same, the standard deviation is still 24 photons. The signal collected from the object, in this case, is 48 photons per pixel. So the signal to noise ratio has become two. 
And if you look at the chart on the, the left, you start seeing that there is an increase around the center. You still cannot really tell if it's uh, how sharp it is. It could be anything. So it's maybe it's on the verge of being detectable. Now let's make it even brighter. Uh, this is another example, uh, same background, but the signal from the object is now 0.2 photons per second per pixel. So we have a signal of uh, collected by each of the photons of so uh, additional signal of 120 photons per pixel. This is five times higher than the standard deviation. And uh, at least uh, to me, this in the chart uh, on the, in the graph on, on the left, this is clearly detectable. You can see that there is a, a, a change, a square, a square wave, so to speak. Now, that's, this is great, but uh, we are not in this simulation, right? It's, uh, in reality, it's too bad that we cannot just crank up the brightness of an object that we would like to image, just like I did in the simulation. What we can do is to change the other element of the signal to noise ratio. We change uh, the, the number this goes, is below the, the fraction sign. For instance, we can turn off like pollution by loading the telescope in the car and driving to the Sierra. Or we could increase the exposure time or equivalently stack together multiple exposure. Uh, this works, but it takes patience because uh, the signal to noise ratio only goes up like the square of the total integration time. I have uh, hand drawn here what could be the, uh, the relationship uh, of uh, signal to noise ratio on the vertical axis and integration time. And uh, to me, this is a law of diminishing returns. You have to go, uh, if you want to double signal to noise ratio, you have to quadruple uh, the exposure time. So uh, you, you're, if you already image for one hour, the next uh, big, the max big change will require four hours and then 16 and then 64, right? Quickly becomes unmanageable. But let's see how narrowband can lend a hand. There's another way to decrease the number of photons uh, from, uh, the, from light pollution and it's to use a filter. Of course, we would need a filter that blocks the photons from light pollution and not those from the object of our interest. Well, an arrow band filter does exactly that if it matches the wavelength of the object light. So if you, have a, if you want to image a nice hydrogen cloud and you're using an H-alpha filter, almost all of the photos of 656.3 nanometer wavelength will go through. These narrow band filters typically have a transmission of 19 to 95%, pretty good. But of course, it doesn't work for all targets. It works great for emission nebulae, that could be gas clouds, but also planetary nebulae. It doesn't work for uh, dark nebulae. It doesn't really work well for the reflection nebulae because reflection nebulae typically reflect the light of a star. As we know, the light of a star is a, has a black body spectrum. And it doesn't work really well for galaxies unless you want to image the H alpha regions of that galaxy or O3 region of the galaxy, because galaxies are mostly made of stars and stars have a continuous spectrum. However, if the galaxy is close enough, there is a benefit in imaging it also in H alpha because it, it uh, highlights the regions of star formation, the H2 regions. How does our simulation change if I introduce narrowband? So this is just the same slide that I showed you, the one in which I cannot basically detect what's going on in the center by looking at the graph because my signal to noise ratio is close to one. Now let's put a three nanometer filter in front of my telescope. So instead of collecting one photon per second per pixel, assuming that this was done with, a, let's say a green filter, 100 nanometer wide, instead of receiving one, one photon per second per pixel, I'm going to receive uh, 0 0.03 photons per second per pixel because I, assuming that the, the background sky is uniformly distributed, and it's a big assumption, but let's simplify things, I'm only going to receive 3% uh, of, uh, of the incident radiation. And uh, I am also going to reduce a little bit of the signal, but assuming that this has 90% uh, transmission, 
I went from 0 0.05 photons per second per pixel to 0 0.045, not a big difference. But look at, the look at the graph, a lot has changed here. And the reason why a lot has changed is that uh, the mean uh, signal from the background went from uh, 600 photons per pixel to only 18. It's, uh, well, it's 3%. As a consequence, the standard deviation also went down and it's now just four photons per pixel. The signal, on the other hand, went from 30 photons per pixel to just 20, 227, did not go down by much. The signal to noise ratio has increased a lot. We went from a signal to noise ratio of one to a signal to noise ratio of six, which makes this object very detectable, as you can see. So the big benefit of doing uh, narrowband uh, imaging, uh, for, especially from light polluted areas, is uh, in uh, the signal to noise ratio. If I compare a narrowband uh, line filter to a broadband filter, the, the narrowband filter cuts the signal from the background by a factor of, of uh, the ratio between uh, the, the narrow, the bandwidth of the narrowband filter divided by the bandwidth of the broadband filter. Then the associated noise will be reduced by the square root of this ratio. Or if you prefer, by inverting the fraction, if the signal from the object uh, is uh, transmitted entirely, let's say 95% of it, the signal to noise ratio goes up by the inverse of those factors. In the, assuming that you start uh, with a 100 nanometer filter and you end up uh, with uh, um, with a five nanometer filter by switching the broadband with the, the narrowband, the signal to noise ratio increases by four and a half times. That's pretty significant. So now that we have uh, an understanding and we have uh, our appetite wet by, by this, how do we do, how do we, what do we need to do to capture narrowband data? Well, you need to, you mentioned, Inevitably, you are going to have to get some filters. You're going to have to spend some money on filters. There is a one traditional way that uh, has always been, uh, been around, uh, and it's to use uh, what's called a monochromatic camera. It's actually, in my opinion, a misnomer. It should be called a panchromatic camera because it doesn't look, uh, doesn't see only one color. It sees all colors, but sees them identically, so it doesn't differentiate between uh, between colors. And then you have in front of this uh, panchromatic camera a filter wheel, and in the carousel of this filter wheel, you put uh, uh, the typical three filter, H alpha, O3, and uh, S2. But more recently, there's, an, there's been an alternative. Uh, a number of uh, multi narrowband filters have hit the market. I believe that one of the first ones, primarily the most famous, was the Radian Triad. These are filters that uh, transmit multiple narrow wave um, windows of the spectrum. And the idea is to use them uh, with uh, one-shot color cameras or even DSLRs. The filter is uh, designed uh, so that uh, the windows that will be transmitted are somewhat compatible with uh, the transmit windows of the Bayer matrix so that you're going to get some signal in the red pixels, in the green pixels, and in the blue, in the blue pixels. And so you're not wasting uh, your uh, your color um, <clears throat> your color sensor in the same way that you would uh, if you just put a single narrowband filter in front of it. There's also a, a reason to use them uh, with uh, with mono camera as an alternative to luminance to the luminance filter. So luminance is a filter that cuts everything uh, shorter than 400 nanometer and typically longer than 700 nanometers. But instead of using that, you could use a small, uh, you could use a multi narrowband filter if what you're trying to image, of course, is uh, emitting light in those uh, in those wavelengths. There's also another benefit of using uh, uh, those, uh, in particular, to using a mono camera with uh, narrowband filters, is that uh, your uh, any chromatic aberration that you may have in in your system it becomes almost negligible because uh, each time you're going to image one, one very narrow window of, uh, of the spectrum. So there will be no significant dispersion inside that. And you're going to be focused each time. So everything will be sharp, although they are not sharp at the same time, because you're imaging three 
in, in three installments, essentially. These are just some examples of uh, the, some manufacturers of uh, narrowband filters that you can find. Probably the two best, uh, the two that are considered the best from a quality perspective are Astrodome and Chroma. They are also the most expensive. Um, Astronomic is another very reputable brand. This is German. Uh, Bader is also German. Uh, they do. They make narrowband filters. They made a, a new series that came out last year. There's been some controversy about those, uh, especially if you image with the fast death ratios. I use them. They work for me, but your mileage may vary. And of course, there are also other players on the market like Optolong that makes a lot of optics for uh, for for amateurs, and uh, also Antlia, I believe, has a set of 3.5 uh, nanometer filter in SHO. And I'm sure that there are other ones too. And these are also some examples of uh, multi narrowband filters. I already mentioned the OPT triad, sorry, the Radiant slash OPT triad, triad ultra filter. Despite the name, it does not uh, transmit three, uh, three sections of the spectrum, but four. So there's a S2, H alpha, O3, and H beta. So they, in this way, they try to cover all of the three uh, Bayer sensors, sorry, Bayer filters. Uh, there's a Optolon that's always been present uh, with their L extreme filter. So you see the name recalls the fact that you can use it as a, as a luminance substitute. And uh, has pretty narrow bandwidth, as you can see from this chart. And more recently, IDAS has come up with uh, come out with some um, multi narrowband filter. Although they are not as narrow as the other ones, they try to tell you that it's a benefit because, uh, in addition to capturing H alpha, you also capture the ionized nitrogen, and uh, in addition to capturing O3, you also capture uh, H beta and the second line of O3 at 495 nanometers. But of course, you, the, the price that you pay for that is that you also capture more light pollution. So there's a, there's a trade-off here. There is, a, however, one drawback in all of this. And the drawback is that our narrowband filters are so effective in cutting down the background signal that uh, the magnitude of the photon noise, as we saw, also goes down. And it may go down to the point that it becomes similar to the magnitude of the camera's inherent readout noise. And this is a problem because uh, it's uh, noise adds, although it doesn't add uh, algebraically, it adds in quadrature, but you don't want uh, to, uh, to be dominated by the camera's readout noise. You want your images to be dominated by uh, essentially photon noise. And there are two things that you can do to achieve this. You could decrease the read noise of your camera, which is possible in some, uh, to some extent, because typically most, uh, most of CMOS cameras and also CCD cameras, by increasing the gain, the um, read noise goes down. But two things, one thing it's important to, to, to be careful about is that watch your well capacity. So most cameras, actually all cameras have the largest full well capacity at low gain, where the read noise is higher, and the, the full well capacity decreases proportionally as you increase the gain. The other thing you can do, although it seems counterintuitive, is to increase the, the photon noise. Now, why on earth we would, want, would we want to increase noise? Because actually, you're not increasing noise. You're increasing the signal, and noise goes, uh, up, goes up as a consequence. And increasing the signal in this case, it means that you increase the exposure time. So we expose for a longer time. These are two charts that I took from the ZWO website. This is for the ASI 2600mm. And you can see the top chart shows the full well capacity as a function of gain. And you can see I increase the gain and the full well capacity goes down. And that's kind of inevitable. Uh, the, but it, what's interesting is the bottom chart. There's a, like many modern cameras, there is one critical value of uh, the, the gain parameter that triggers uh, the high gain mode or something like that and uh, makes uh, the, creates this uh, sharp step and uh, the readout noise goes down 
uh, starts from 2.8 uh, uh, electrons per pixel at uh, gain 99, and it goes down to 1.45 electrons per pixel at gain 100. That's a huge change. Of course, you may want to say, okay, but why should I stop there? I, I go, I crank the gain up to 450, and when I have one electron per pixel of red noise, yes, yeah, true, but you're only going to have a, a few hundred electrons as a full bell capacity. So you're going to reach saturation very quickly. So be careful. The other aspect, so we said this was about uh, gain. The other parameter that we can play with is exposure time. You might have heard with that with all the CCDs cameras that had very high read noise, like 10, 15 electrons read noise, narrowband used to require very long sub exposures, up to 60 minutes. Now this to me reminds me of the days uh, of film uh, astro imaging in which you, you expose for such a long time that if an airplane or a satellite crossed the field, you start the swearing because you had just had wasted an hour. <clears throat> But uh, low noise of CMOS cameras have changed this. Nowadays, with the, CMOS, with the modern CMOS cameras, the read out noise is so low that less than five minutes are sufficient to swamp read noise, even from, uh, I mean, for, even from not so, not more than nine. You can do it uh, from more than five or more than six and still swamp noise. And this also brings me to another point that is worth uh, mentioning. So these are a few examples that I'm going to give you. Uh, but the question that I want to answer is, if you want to take full advantage of, uh, is it worth imaging in narrowband from a low bottle site? Is it worth driving to pinnacles and imaging in narrowband? And in order to answer these questions, I'm going back to one slide and I want to show you two charts. Now, this chart is actually an analog, an analog exposure calculator. It's called a nomogram, and it's something that I developed. And uh, it allows you to uh, estimate the minimum exposure time that you should use uh, based on a series of parameters. So it, it needs to be read from left to right. So you start, uh, this is an example for Bertel 7. So you start uh, plotting a line that goes from uh, the, the point that corresponds to the bright to the radiance of your sky in magnitudes per square x second. Now, I am on board the seven, and my sky is typically, uh, when I measure it with my SQM, uh, I read 18.5 uh, magnitudes per square x second. So my line goes from this point, goes through the point that corresponded to the F ratio of my telescope. And then I, I keep on drawing with the pencil and the square and the straight edge until I meet this vertical line. Then from this point, I draw another line that goes through the point that corresponds to my, it's called the spectral efficiency of my filter. And it's the rate, it's the, it's the fraction that is essentially my, the bandwidth of my filter, delta lambda, divided by the central wavelength of my filter. This is an example calculated for a five nanometer H alpha filter that has a spectral efficiency of 0 0.075. And uh, again, this line will hit uh, a point on this uh, vertical, uh, vertical line. And I'm gonna draw another line going through the point that corresponds to, my, to the pixel size of my camera. And I'm, this is gonna land somewhere on the, that scale called the phi, phi in photons per second. And that is the estimation of how many photons per second per pixels I'm going to receive from the background sky. Then I, I plot yet another line through this scale uh, with uh, the eta parameter, which is the quantum efficiency. In this case, I estimated 80% uh, uh, quantum efficiency. This is calculated for the ASI 2600. And I see that this corresponds to receiving uh, in each pixels 0.2 electrons per second. Finally, the last step is to draw the final line from this point that we just calculated through the point that corresponds to the read noise of my camera. Let's assume that I set my camera for gain 100, so my, my readout noise is 1.5 electrons, and I get to the final answer. The minimum exposure time that I want is a one point, about 1.9 minutes. So from portal seven, two minutes are sufficient. What if I go to Pinnacles, portal three? Things change. 
So Pinnacles has a 21.5 uh, magnitudes per square second. So if I, if I redo all this geometrical construction with pencil and uh, straight uh, edge, I get that I should expose for 30 minutes each sub-exposure if I want to reap the full benefits of the increased the signal to noise ratio that I can get from that sky. So by, by this, I mean that uh, the, the, the ratio of the brightness of the pinnacle sky and the, and the mountain view sky is one to 20. So it means that if I expose for, uh, to, for using this uh, suggested 30 minutes, I'm gonna get a, a signal to noise ratio which is 20 times better than I can get from, uh, <clears throat> from mountain view for the same total integration time. So is it worth doing that? Well, it depends on many things. It depends on whether you, whether your mount is up to it, whether your mechanics are up to holding a 30 minute exposure without a differential fracture, or if you use a OAG, if you're, you're probably in a better place, is your guiding up to this task. But in general, I would say, even if you don't do this 30 minutes, if you just do 10, yeah, you're gonna give up something, but it's, uh, uh, it's much better to have uh, some data that have no data because uh, something went wrong in between. So my final message, and this is my last slide, is that don't sweat too much over it. Just get out and start imaging. And uh, you have two months to capture uh, all the data that you want. And in two months, we're gonna talk about how to process the data. Thank you very much. Is there any questions that I can take? I'm sorry, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> I couldn't find my unmute button, but please. Questions for Francesco. I have a basic question about physics, which is that hydrogen alpha is a transition between the N3 to N2 line, right? What right. happens to the N2 to N1 line? It's, um, it's not in the visible spectrum. Is it brighter in its uh, wavelength than the N3 to 2? It's in, um, I don't know about brighter, but it's in the infrared. Okay. You mean the UV? It's, it's higher energy. It's a bigger- Sorry, energy. higher energy. Yeah. So it's, it's a UV line. And so, yeah, that would be the primary line. That is a big line uh, for radio. I mean, not radio, but for um, UV. But right. since we're talking about uh, visible light. Three. A great presentation, Francesco. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, Francesco? Yep. Um, do they make narrowband filters that screw on the front of camera lenses, or where would you place them? Uh, yeah, they do. Um, it's a great question. Lumicon used to do that. I remember that Lumicon had uh, H-alpha filters that uh, had the 49 millimeter standard uh, thread for, uh, uh, for photographic lenses and also 52 millimeters. I believe they, they went all the way up to 72 that it was extremely expensive. Nowadays, I haven't, uh, I haven't seen any. However, <clears throat> both the Chroma and the Baylor, they make filters in the, um, I believe in the square 65 by 65 millimeter format that you can put uh, in, a, in a filter holder that you can that you then screw in front of oh, your camera. I understand. So it's a square 60, 65 millimeter square. And yeah. like I used to do 50 years ago, you when I used rat and gelatin filters, you drop yeah. that in a square in front of the lens. So back, uh, given that you mentioned uh, years ago, I was doing, uh, I didn't have an H-alpha filter back then. I was using uh, the Technical Pan 2415 film that was very sensitive to red. And I used the Rattan 29 filter as yes. a makeshift H-alpha in, in front of the camera. Yes. There's also, uh, I, I remember Astronomic used to make uh, clip-in filters that actually fit Right. In front. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yep. That's, so those are, I had one for, uh, for my Nikon. The problem with those filters is that they are tailor made for that particular camera model. And when you change it, when you replace your camera, you're basically have, you're going to have to replace the filter as well. 
what what uh, uh, focal length camera lens do you typically use for getting those nebulae? So I'm I'm actually using my telescope, and uh, uh, it's uh, I should uh, remove my my blurry blurry screen better. Telescope is here, so you see the camera. I do this indeed. It's a it's a beautiful instrument, but given that I, is... I'm I'm rather spending my money on camera equipment, um, it's either one or the other. Right. So, for uh, one lens that I personally don't have, but has become very popular in recent years, is the Samyang. Uh, or a Rocky Nono 135. I, I have one. Oh, perfect. <laughs> it's a manual focusing lens, uh, and I have it in Nikon F mount. Perfect. So uh, you can, uh, there's one thing that you want to be careful of, uh, about. Uh, if you, that is a very fast lens, F2. So if you can put the filter in two positions in, uh, in that, uh, with that lens, you can put it in, a, maybe not with a DSLR, but with an Astro camera, you can have a, a filter drawer and put it between the lens and the camera. Yeah. If you do that, you need to buy special filters that are, and they have the central wavelength pre-shifted for very fast death ratios because right. of the, right. Yeah, and because the bandwidth, the, the central frequency is calculated based on the cone formed by the light rays when they meet the sensor, when they meet the filter, actually. But if you put the filter on in front of the of the frontal lens, then the, the, the wave is a, is a flat, is a plane wave at the point. So perfect. You don't have any problem with, and you don't need to push shift. Right. The drawback is that any error that on the wave front that is introduced by the but the filter will be amplified on the focal plane. But if the magnification of the lens is not too high, like a 135 millimeter one, you yeah. should be still in, in good shape. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Do we have any more questions for Francesco? Uh, sorry. Francesco, Nothing. sometimes uh, with these narrowband filters, I've had uh, reflections inside the refractor. Uh, do yes. you have any comments about that and what to do about it? So the <clears throat> yes, there are uh, ref reflections are a problem, and uh, there seems to be this seems to be one of the cases in which uh, the rule. Uh, and by, by twice applies. And the people who use expensive filters like Chromas and uh, <clears throat> or Astrodon in general don't have these problems. And uh, of course, no manufacturer tells you their respect, but there seems to be a correlation between uh, how the, the type of multi coating that they put on the filter and uh, the how big, uh, how strong is the reflection that you're going to get. The, uh, apparently, the optical filters were pretty bad, but they recently changed. They improved a lot. Beta was also very bad, but uh, <clears throat> I have the, the latest generation uh, beta filters, and the real, I have no reflections even in a relatively bright star. I did a 10 minute uh, HF exposure on uh, the NAB, and uh, there's no reflection essentially. But yeah, it's, uh, it's a problem. And uh, some people <clears throat> have noticed that. Uh, the type of coating that they put on the filter is not the same on the front side and the mid. So if you have a strong reflection, it may be worth trying to flip the filter and see if it's any better on the other side. Paolo, did you have a question? Oh, no, not a question, but a, a, a side note uh, about what uh, uh, I think Alan before was asking about the, um, the photographic lens to use. I think that the sweet spot uh, is also between 300 and 400 in my experience. Uh, there, are, there are, let's say, 
beautiful target in the 135 or 150 but uh, if you want to do some some nice nebula or something like that you have to have a short a longer focal length but anyway 300 uh, or 400 uh, tele lens is more than perfect not oh, as interest, possible an interesting project that i have on my hands is uh, to reuse for astronomy this uh, beautiful uh, <coughs> pentax 135 uh, millimeter lens from the early yeah. 70s used to be used to belong to my father and uh, of course, nowadays, this is not an apochromatic lens. It would have a chromatic aberration in, uh, in full color. But my idea is to use it in narrow band. And so I want to put uh, uh, some focusing mechanism that would turn uh, this helicoid to, to refocus when I switch filters. And so I can have perfect focus at all three wavelengths. And I hope I can, I can get there. Yeah, it's feasible. So I uh, and I'm taking it that what you're doing is is that you're you're taking a series of exposures with one filter, then even though you're leaving the camera on the tracker, you're then replacing the filter with the next filter, taking exposures, yeah. then you replace it with another filter. Yeah, and it, this is and in a, in a setup like the one I have, this is automatic because the filters are mounted in a carousel in front of the camera between the camera and the telescope essentially. And there is, a, there is a stepper motor that controls this carousel. So the computer tells the camera, now go in H alpha. And the camera goes in H alpha and the, the computer knows that the program has uh, stored uh, in its memory. What is the, the difference in the focus point when I switch from H alpha to O3 and tells the focus motor to move to compensate for that. So it's a, uh, you can, uh, with this level of automation, you can, if you want, you can take 20, 20 images, one filter, and then 20 in another one, and then 20 in the third one, or you can uh, do 111, 111, 111, and uh, change every time, because you don't need to refocus everything is, you can predictably and reliably automate that part. And, just and we can discuss uh, uh, what is the best strategy, depending on what is the the, the say the environment if you have the moon or something like that probably is better to do a one 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 or two 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 instead of 20 yeah. 20 20 because the, the gradient will be different yeah and there's also um just a for those of us with reflectors uh, you may not have a focus difference uh, between your filters yeah even better if your yeah, filters are powerful Sometimes depends from of, of the filter also. If you mix uh, different filters, sometimes you have different uh, right. focal point because the, the filter are different in uh, in thickness. Right. That's a good point. Uh, one question that uh, one question that you probably have added to my presentation is: Can you mix different filters from different brands? Yes, of course. The filter what what counts is the only the wavelength and the bandwidth of the filters. However, if you do that you may need to be prepared for uh, some more refocusing because uh, if the filters were cut from the same piece of glass substrate as the same thickness, they will likely be parfocal. So they don't, you are not going to need to refocus, but if they come from different manufacturers, they likely have different thicknesses and uh, maybe the glass has different uh, refractive index. So uh, you're going to, you're going to, you will want to verify. In my experience, uh, uh, astrodon and chroma are parfocal. Yeah. At least the one that I have. <laughs> uh, everybody says so that uh, if you if you can spend uh, the amount of money that they want, uh, it's definitely worth it. Yeah, especially uh, astrodon is virtually disappeared from the market in this moment. Okay. At least uh, up to one and a half month ago when I check. So no, we're, we're going to see them in uh, we're going to see them in auction houses, I guess. Mm. But that's why when I first started uh, imaging, that was the, the big misconception I had. Like I bought these so-called parfocal filters, and then but I used them with my refractor, and the filters were parfocal. But because the refractor, I, the bottom line was you 
despite the way they're advertised, you do have to change the focus between your filters. And if I you have a, a Richie Chrétien, probably not. Right. No, no, I'm saying for refractors. Now, reflectors, it's another story. Now, uh, Nick, Nick has a, a comment. Uh, if you want Astrodon, use iTelescope for free. All right, any other uh, questions? All righty then. Well, thank you very much, Francesco. Uh, we look forward to hearing you from you in a couple months. Everybody will take all their narrow band images and maybe you'll give us some practice uh, data to play with before that. Yep. That uh, processing section. And then again, next month, we, we have a, a talk. You were talking about uh, making a, a focuser uh, for your lens. And uh, Julian will talk about that and other uh, pro uh, maker projects next month. And thank you very much, everybody. Please unmute and give Francesco a hand. Thank you very much. Yay. <laughs> Bye-bye, everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs>